registrato sotto la supervisione di Bob Rock. This is the Skid Row Special. The last album was in 1991, Slave to the Green. So it was four years ago. How does it come it took you so long to have a new album out? Well, basically, I think it's due to the fact that we've always like had high standards for ourselves as far as songwriting goes. You know, um, the first record came out, and you know, we came up with the record in uh, Rachel's garage, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we always like went inside, you know, for our inspiration inside our own hearts. So uh, after it came, the first album came out and did so good. Then we, you know, applied the same principles to our Slave to the Grind record, and we even, you know, made an even more self-satisfying record, which was, uh, like, a, that did really well. So when it came time to, to write our new record, we wanted to make sure that we had songs that we liked and we thought were better songs than what we put out before. But when you've had songs like I Remember You and 18 in Life and Monkey Business and uh, Slave to the Grind, like they, that's a high standard of songs because a lot of people have related to them. So it, for us, it took us like, you know, we got off the road in January 93 and it took us about a year to get, uh, you know, 13 or 14 songs that we thought were better than the ones we put out before. Slave to the Grind for about two years. The tour lasted almost two years, and uh, by the time we got back from touring, we really needed to get away from each other and everything and music and all of that. So uh, by the time we re regrouped, a year had passed by, and uh, you know we started writing at that point, and it, it took a it took a while, you know. Do you believe in God? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. 100%. It took us about two and a half months to three months to do the record, which is a fairly short time. About the same time it took to do the other albums. We did pre-production in the studio, uh, and everything that we were trying out went to tape as well, so that uh, we didn't miss anything, you know. And working with Bob was... Uh, It was a completely different experience because we were working, we, we've had the luxury of working with two of the best producers in the war, world, Michael Wagner and Bob Rock, and uh, you just want to hit me in the mouth with that thing. No, no, and, I'm just saying hi to the people. And, and uh, so, they both work completely different. You know, Michael's very organized and uh, he has a, a set way of doing things and, and Bob is like, kind of like controlled chaos almost, you know. But it, it was good, I think uh, the end result was well so, worth it. Do you scared of dying? Well, there's not much you can do about it, really, so, no. I don't know. It doesn't really appeal to me. <laughs> uh, what kind of the problem is you can only do it once. <laughs> We recorded in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and that's the western side of Canada. And um, with Bob Rock, he was he produced the album, and... Uh, Bob Rock from, you know, Motley Crue yeah, and all the same people. old Bob Rock, right. And uh, the, the recording process was... For me, for me, uh, and and for the guys, I mean, it was it was really, it it was the most fun of any of the albums I've I've done so far. I just loved it. It was it was a great time. Um, Bob made me feel real comfortable. He made the band feel actually. He made us feel comfortable after he made us feel real uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, we, what do you mean with that? Well, what he did, what he wanted to do was he kind of uh, broke down all our old habits. What we what we used to do, you know, the two albums prior we did with Michael Wagner, uh, and we were used to doing it a certain way. So he kind of took us out of that element, and and is, I think it brought about a bit more spontaneity in that so, matter. What kind of music would you like to be played at your funeral? <laughs> we were just talking about this yeah. yesterday. I mean, uh, we were, me and Rachel were talking about 
just funerals and being cremated or having a funeral or things like that, you know. Uh, we were talking about this, and, and I don't know what it's like here, but... Uh, like wakes and funerals are always so depressing and they're really they're really like a downer and so I'm gonna have an open bar at mine there's gonna be a bartender an open bar I'm gonna be buried with a smile on my face and I'm gonna have like all my favorite music that I grew up on playing loud and you're not allowed at my thing unless you're gonna party like have a good time that's a fact too we wanted to get the best collection of songs that we'd ever have you know, like the first album, Skid Row, was, I think, a really innocent record. You know, uh, I was 19 years old when I recorded that record. <laughs> That's a big tune. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the first record was really an innocent album, kind of, you know, young, and it sounds really young. And, uh, you know, I, I remember looking back at some of my old interviews back, you know, when I was 20 years old, and people would say, so how was it in the rock and roll industry? And I'd go, oh, everybody's so nice. They're all on our side. They're all out for us. It's Youth Got Wild, One for One for All, Brotherhood, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then when we got off the road, we found out that uh, how shark infested the waters were of this music industry, and so the Slave to the Grind record was really a um, <laughs> it was a statement of like uh, anger, you know, and and uh, looking back, it's a really angry album, Slave to the Grind. But uh, this record, we wanted to get the emotions that we had on both the records, but have the best songs, you know, that instead of like one album that sounds like, you know, the same production, have different colors and different textures to each different song. Which is the best advice that you got to see? Two, two, uh, don't advice. yeah, don't follow <laughs> Two things stick in my mind whenever... I think of advice. One was um, our old manager Stephen Pritchett said to us. We, we were we weren't even signed yet, and he said to uh, to us, he goes, uh, "You gotta you gotta think sensibly when you're doing things, and if you start making money, and when you're in this business, and you have to be good to people, and because the his, his quote was the train doesn't ride forever. So I, I I'll take that to my grave." Definitely. No, the whole thing was is that you never knew when this, what songs, what the songs were going to sound like and where they were going at any given moment. It was really strange. Um, we kind of like walked in every day with the music and like sometimes the, the bass would be there and some guitars would be there and sometimes they wouldn't be and there would be some vocals. So you really never knew where the thing was going to end up. So every day that you walked in there, it's kind of like you had to come up with something new to sort of add to this painting. And by the end of the whole process, when it all was done, we were like, wow, all right, so that's where it's ending up at, you know? Well, that one came out really good because uh, we had been kind of, you know, arguing a bit and stuff about, you know, taking time off and not taking time off and all this crap. And then the first song that, uh, that I heard, you know, to sing, uh, Rachel, showed me the words too is uh, my enemy and, and the words go your skeletons my skeletons life is only getting shorter you can be my enemy and I don't care keep throwing stones at yourself which is like it's futile to be fighting because you're only hurting yourself you know what I mean it's like a cry to come together as one instead of being against each other all the time One of the easiest videos we've ever done. <laughs> we, we always kind of get nervous when we like to do videos. You don't just, like doing videos? Eh, it's just, it's tedious, you know, but it's, it's. I mean, we had a great time doing this one. Actually, we got, we did two in one day. We did My Enemy and uh, Into Another. Uh, My Enemy was the first song we had written for this record. Um, we were in South America, actually, on the Slave to the Grind tour, 
and Scotty and Rob were uh, just jamming during sound check and, and uh, we started playing around with this riff and went back to my hotel room and Scotty and I finished the song off. So that's actually the oldest tune for it, but uh, it's definitely one of my favorites. Uh, you're watching the Skid Row special here in Italy. got older and I think that you know our focus is a lot more clear you know we used to love to uh, party a lot and we put a lot of uh, focus on that <laughs> not that we don't like to still do that but uh, I think that the, the biggest focus now on it is is making the best music we can and put in performing to the ultimate of our capabilities think that could be compared to the first Kid Row, I mean, as a spirit, as a, as a chemistry of the band? Uh, other, another band right now? Yeah. None. None? Nope. No, because everybody's like, you know, into like being depressed and stuff like that, you know, in music now. It seems like, you, you know, heroin is cool and, you know, suicide and all that stuff. We're, we, our music rep represents life and having a good time and pushing yourself up instead of pushing yourself down. Music has changed, and, and we've changed since 1989, you know, um, and, and we like to think that our music has gone somewhere else, we haven't remained the same. It's important to us that we don't stagnate in, in one certain sound and, and I don't know, one certain theme throughout our music, so, I don't know, as far as the spirit of our first record, uh, I think a lot of this, the newer stuff that's coming out, in spirit anyway, as far as like being up and, and being able to have a good time with music, I think bands like Rancid and Green Day uh, have a good time with music. They don't just sit there and uh, talk about 
all the crap things in life, but they, you know, they enjoy what they're doing. Yeah, they they lighten up a bit. You know, don't be so. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not into bands that are just so heavy into like really negative, negative uh, all that stuff. Yeah. very experimental. We, uh, right from the beginning of writing songs for it, we just try to do everything a little bit different than we always did. You know, we just wanted to experiment and take more chances, and that, uh, that's kind of why we chose a different producer as well. And, and Bob wanted to experiment, you know, and uh, that, that was just the, the main focus, is just to try things we might not have tried in the past. Uh, Beat Yourself Blind, I, th I think uh, it's probably my favorite song on the album. And when the song started, when we started working on it, it was just an idea that that, that these guys had. And we were in the studio, and one thing led to another. We started working on the song in the studio, and uh, hi, <laughs> and. Uh, it it was born in like an afternoon the whole song you know it was like it really it really came alive that one day and by the time we left the studio the song was finished and sounded killer so into another uh was uh one of those songs that kind of, at least for me musically, came about sort of by an accident. And, and uh, the, the, at least started out by accident. But it's one of those songs where um, when me and Rachel write together, uh, it, sometimes it's difficult to communicate what you're trying to say. And I had this idea about something that I wanted to say, but I couldn't get it out lyrically, so I was trying to explain to Rachel. And I remember telling him when he wrote the lyrics, I remember saying to him that, um, that was the first time that someone else came up with the idea. For someone else came up with exactly what I was trying to say, but I couldn't do it, and he was—he did it for me in a sense. So it was—it was a pretty special experience. The title of the album is Subhuman Race. Do you uh, refer to uh, a refer, certain uh, yeah, kind of a, people? Depends on where we can get some. <laughs> what? Do you refer to a certain kind of people uh, with subhuman race? Or? Well, basically, I just think it's uh, a reflection on like what the world is about. You know, in 95, it seems like it's a really hardcore world, and it's motivated by money and, and greed, and everybody's got their own personal agendas, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of humanity around in the world, you know? I can remember when I was young, as a kid, walking down the street, you know, strangers would say hi to you and stuff like that, and you didn't know. And, 
but now it's like you, you've worried if everybody's got a gun or a knife or gonna steal you steal you know or in America they got carjackings and it's just a crazy you know the crime and the, and the greed is just out of control in where we're from anyways it still seems pretty fun in, in, in Italy though yeah maybe we should move here or something <laughs> I'm ready yeah <laughs> Of course, it's just a play on the human race. It's just that, like, it seems in these times we're so quick to prejudge each other, you know, be it the color of our skin or, or, or nationality or religion. It's just a way of saying that uh, it's much easier to be a good person than it is to be a bad person. Yeah, we should be more humane towards each other as individuals. We shouldn't have all these walls and barriers uh, between us. Is there anybody you would like to meet? Uh, I would like to meet Paul McCartney. I almost had a chance. I did have a chance to meet him once, but I was just too nervous. <laughs> I saw him. At, uh, they were playing. They were playing Saturday Night Live in New York City, and a friend of mine is on the show, so he called me up and he said, "This guy's your idol, man. You got to come see him." So I went up, and uh, do you have Saturday Night Live? Over here? No. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, I did last year. But oh, okay. In English. Okay. So they uh, he invited me up, and I went. Paul McCartney was playing on the show, and you know, I was like 10 feet watching him do "Let It Be," 10 feet away from him, and it was blowing my mind. And he walked by. And I was trying to get up the nerve to say something to him, but I just couldn't do it. And that was it. That was the closest I got to Paul McCartney. Oh.